Hey, what's going on, guys? We're talking about the pillars of preparedness. So the first thing we need to do is identify what that even means. So when we're talking pillars of preparedness, understand it's a construct, a very well-organized way of understanding how to be involved in preparedness. I created this because if you haven't realized it yet, preparedness is a very vague genre of a whole bunch of things. So we need to create this structure to line out a path so you can be better prepared. So at the top of this is, think of it as the rooftop. This is mindset. Now we already talked about in a video what mindset is in preparedness. It's resiliency. It's your ability to literally and figuratively get off your butt after you've been kicked down. So in resilience, that leads to best outcomes in survival. In case studies that have studied natural and man-made disasters, the one thing common to all is people's resilience and the correlation to their survivability. Mindset. The next thing from left to right are going to be the pillars of preparedness that include everyday carry, mobility, and then what we're calling homesteading. At the bottom of this is the base, which is the foundation. Let's look at it as like a house, the foundation of preparedness, which is your community. Remember, you can't do anything long-term in survival. There's actually no real good cases of success and preparedness without community. It happened to the Brits in World War II being bombarded by the Germans. It's happened to many cases of civilizations trying to link their skill sets together in order to survive without that social network, without that feeling of community, you're likely not to survive. In our context, we often relate liability to assets. Are you an asset or a value add to your community? Your community could be your own family, your own friends, your own inner circle. Most people don't think they have skill sets or don't think they're necessarily a value because they don't shoot, move, communicate. But it's not about that. It's the nurturing of community. It's canning and jarring. It's sustaining skill sets. It's the morale. There are many people, in fact, everybody that I've come across who could be a value add. Now, liability is different. Toxic people, negative people, people who intentionally sabotage morale are likely to be liabilities. We don't want that in our foundation because that fractured foundation would lead to a tumbling pillar of preparedness. So today we're talking about the first pillar of preparedness from left to right, which is everyday carry. Everyday carry includes everything that you carry on your person. I first learned this understanding of how valuable that is overseas, not even in special operations, but as a contractor with the CIA. When me and Kevin Owens were operating overseas, we had layers of aircraft above us that could protect us. We had roving helicopters that had machine guns and rockets that could annihilate a threat immediately. But operating in austere environments with the CIA, I realized I was my own first response. All I had was a Glock 17 appendix carried in my waistband and a machine gun, if I was lucky, in the trunk of my Land Cruiser. So the idea from everything that I teach and being your own first response and how important everyday carry is stems from that. The reality is America, the citizens of this country, live in a semi-permissive environment every single day. Non-permissive meaning a war zone, permissive meaning no chance of violence, which doesn't exist. So in a semi-permissive environment, you might be operating or living, driving through your neighborhood in Chicago. The great old neighborhood of Austin has some record numbers for crime and violence and homicide. So every, every so often in America, something happens. As it relates to preparedness, it doesn't have to be violent crime. It doesn't have to be terrorism or an active shooter. It could be an accident. I mean, I was driving out of this intersection here, leaving work just the other week, 
when the car in front of me, because they weren't situationally, situationally aware, got T-boned by a car going 60 miles an hour. Now, not to say I was e any more aware, but I do check left and right because I have situational awareness, conscious awareness of my environment. Most often, I saw the car coming a mile away, almost literally a mile away. Uh, it impacted the car. Luckily for them, they survived because they hit the front left quarter panel and not the side of the door, which most likely would have killed at least the driver. So you live like a GRS singleton, a global response staff officer operating in an austere environment. Your world could go really bad in, at any moment. So how do we prepare for that? It starts with your individual carry, and I'm not just talking about pistol. People have asked me, like, why do I carry this everywhere I go? Well, the best answer I have for you is because it carries all my crap in one large bag. Um, one, this should not be Patagonia. It should be ours. But I don't have great options right now because we're waiting out uh, the line out of our equipment to be manufactured currently. So the reason this is a viable option for me is because in my environment, fly fishing is a common recreational thing that happens. I was fly fishing yesterday in a frozen river uh, right down the road. So this fly fishing bag, which is eight liters of capacity, is my capability. What I mean is the equipment in here lends itself to my survival, but also the training behind that equipment. If I didn't have this bag and something went very wrong, I potentially would suffer the consequences of not having that in my possession. So everyday carry is everything from the shoes you wear to the ball cap that you have on your head. Yes, that intimate in detail. When I was in GRS, I was in Yemen, in a very remote place of the world. And one of my team leaders said, hey Mike, just so you know, you can't wear flip-flops. I'm Asian, I like flip-flops, and that's how I roll, because I like to be comfortable. But everything he explained to me made me understand that even my shoes that I'm wearing could lend themselves to my survivability. So I started wearing Solomon shoes because if I didn't have the ability to run, shoot, move, and communicate, that could mean somebody was going to die, including myself. So whether that was breaking contact to get to my weapon systems, or it was moving to help somebody in a defenseless position, my job was protection. So even the shoes I wore, even the socks I wore were a consideration in that environment. So the start point for everyday carry to me is your security. One of the principles of patrolling in the U.S. Army infantry and special operations is security. It's something that's ingrained in us, meaning it's the number one thing we always consider, even when we're trying to get comfortable. Even when trying to bed down and rest for the night, security is the principle that never falls apart. You lose security, you potentially lose life. So I have to have the ability to proactively engage with my world and environment and stay offensive. But if I don't have the physical tool in my hand, or in this case in my waistband, to defend my life or defend the lives of my loved ones, then you're not a capability. You're a liability. So I always recommend different carries. In this, gu in this bag, I have an HKP7. It's a very expensive German handgun that is activated with a grip safety that allows you to fire it. Why? Because I always have rounds in my chamber when I have firearms, but I don't have a holster for that gun because it's in a loose bag. I also don't like to have single action type guns that have the ability of being triggered or shot because it's rubbing against an obstacle or something inside of the bag. So that's the perfect setup for that. I recommend carrying inside your waistband for, for most people. That is an appendix carry. An appendix carry is not actually on your appendix. It's center line of your belly button, right at your waistline of your belt. The reason that's important is because of a draw stroke, it allows you to maneuver the space uh, by removing material and accessing the grip of the gun to clear the gun from that clothing and allow your, your uh, hand to get in front of you in presentation 
to prevent loss of life and defend yours. The reason I think it's most important is because it's probably more comfortable than other carries and more accessible. What I mean is if you have one on your waistband and you're sitting down, you groove or you bend at the waist. So if the barrel of the gun's sitting in your leg, one that's probably pointed at your femoral artery and that's smart, but it's also uncomfortable. You have courtesy to human uh, and, and biology, I would call it, you have a crotch area region that is a space, but then you have hip flexors that maneuver your legs up and down. Most people sit like me in this position when they're driving, when they're at their desk, when they're at their home. So if you have that again in the groove of where your legs been, it's not gonna be comfortable. So that is the best practice because when you have uh, something that's comfortable, you're more likely to use it. Also, when we look at how we carry things, if we have to maneuver it around different parts of our body, like our extremities, we're less likely to be low vis, meaning less likely um, to not allow the world to know that we have a pistol on us, which is the entire point. Concealed carry is concealed for a reason. So I encourage people to look at appendix carry. Now, people ask me routinely, hey, what gun do you recommend? This isn't a time and place for a pistol course, but I'll tell you, my best recommendation is a Glock 19 single action only pistol that's chambered in nine millimeter, and it is readily available for, for anybody for purchase. It's one of the most highly circulated pistols on the market. When people ask me the recommendation for pistol, they often think compact, like smaller is better. It's not. Um, there is a median. The first thing I do when somebody says, hey, I want to get a gun, I'm not sure, let me see your hand. Because most of us, our hands aren't created equal. I mean, I could, I could shoot a Desert Eagle 10 millimeter and not have a problem with managing muzzle flip and recoil. But other people who are, I don't know, they have small hands. So if you have small hands, I'm not going to recommend that you have a full-size Glock 17, for example. Glock 19 is about the medium or median for uh, people who want a pistol that's subcompact, meaning smaller than full size, but also aren't giving up a lot because you have 15 rounds plus one in the chamber. You could get a base plate. You could actually have 17 plus one, and it's fairly compactable in your waistband. Also, a rule of thumb for me is tourniquets. Look, a tourniquet, which is a uh, I recommend uh, the North American Rescue Cat 7, for example, is something that's often neglected. Med often is. First aid often is. Because it's not as cool and sexy as a gun. But I tell you what, I'm more likely and have been more likely to use life-saving equipment in the civilian space uh, to protect life and to save life than anything else. I've actually applied tourniquets to people in civilian type situations to save their life several times as a just normal person, a civilian. So I recommend stopping the bleed because if you're going to wait the average response time in America for a first responder, you're likely to bleed out already. That could be a minor traffic accident or, or a minor accident that takes place in your, in your house. That obviously leads to catastrophic circumstances. For moral and brachial bleeds, arterial bleeds, are very dangerous and can compromise your life. I, in addition to that, carry several things that are gonna benefit you in everyday carry. One of the things that I carry that's not really talked about because of the education is communication equipment. When the infrastructure collapses, what normally goes down is electricity. That is tethered and tied to everything around us, including the GSM, CDMA, cell phone towers that are right down the road that bounce off your cell phone to give you reception. When that's gone, you don't have reception. You've probably already experienced this in storms or loss of electricity. Well, in disasters, natural or man-made, man-made meaning they targeted the infrastructure, natural meaning it was obliterated from a natural disaster, you're going to need contingencies. I teach something called the PACE plan, PACE. It's primary, alternate, contingency, and emergency. In my life, everything I do, I have a pace plan. I have an understanding that many things in life fail. 
If they fail, then you should have a contingency or a backup to that primary plan, which is called our alternate plan. When we think like this in redundant systems, that also affords us the opportunity in backing that redundant system with service and support to be taken care of. In this particular bag, I have a SAT phone because CDMA and GSM that's tethered to that uh, system is likely to go down with electricity. So is the Wi-Fi that your phone's mostly dependent on. So how are you gonna communicate? A satellite phone, which directly communicates to the satellite above you in the sky, is one of the best options. People don't understand that, that you literally have to walk outside, extend the antenna 45 degrees and hit the satellite that you're going to bounce that communications to and from. That means if you have somebody on the other end of that that has a cell phone in a different area, you could communicate to them, text them, do all the normal things that you do on a phone. The last part of that contingency, it's never the last, but the last part in the conversation is a ham radio. Most people think ham radios are walkie-talkies that you buy from Bass Pro. They're not. What they are are a infrastructure of base stations and relay stations that relay communications in a time of an emergency. You could pick one up online. You could pick one up uh, generally at ham radio stores, which exist actually. And this allows you to not only transmit communication, but also, I think most importantly, receive. FEMA and most government organizations and disasters are gonna communicate on ham radio. Not only in inner communications to and from each other, but also in the broadcast the net broadcast to everybody who's listening to that. And if the GSM phone you have in your back pocket doesn't have electricity, you're not going to be able to hear that communications without a ham radio. 20 bucks on, on any online store, relatively cheap. Something else that I look in this bag that I, that I carry routinely um, is the ability to navigate. Now, navigation is, is something that we all refer to as our cell phone in the map section. Google Maps, Waze, the list goes on. You have to have the ability to do land navigation via, I can't even believe I'm saying rudimentary ways, but a map and a compass. Whether that's lat long, MGRS, whatever the situation may be in your backyard, you need to know how to use a compass, point and walk on an azimuth or a cardinal direction and understand what that means. Um, Kevin Owens, who uh, is a survival expert, but also a land navigation expert, focuses on that for, for the company, Philcraft Survival, and you need to take one of his courses. I have both a Utah local map and a compass. Most of the time on my shoes, I wear a compass that's attached to my laces because I want the ability to do that. Can you tell me where north is right now with no sun up in the sky? More likely not. A compass will do that for you. Um, there's a whole bunch of things that tie into everyday carry that I'm not going to talk about and educate you on. But here's what I, in conclusion, here's what I want you to understand. All the things that deal in everyday carry depend on your geographical and life circumstance. Because if you live in rural Montana, your situation and redundancy and a pace plan lined out for specific equipment may look very different for somebody living in Florida. For example, in Montana, in rural Montana, you can go in places where you drive 200 plus miles and you see no infrastructure. What do you do when you break down in between point A and point B on that road? How do you keep yourself warm? Do you carry a big lighter? Do you carry the ability to communicate to somebody in that rural circumstance? That's going to change and vary depending on where you are in the world. Also, it depends on the laws uh, in the state that you live. Most people uh, in major metropolitan areas can't carry concealed. Some places like Washington, D.C., you can't even have a gun in your car, uh, open carried, uh, concealed, period. So you have to be able to navigate. Pace allows you to line that out and make sure you have all the options that are going to fit that environment. Guys, the next 
pillar of preparedness that we're going to focus on is mobility. It's going to be me walking around a vehicle to show you exactly what that means. Thanks so much for tuning in. I look forward to the next conversation of pillars of preparedness.